Exciting isn't the word that springs to mind in my current state. I've been here about 24 hours from Europe. Um, so I was just saying to someone, it feels like it's breakfast time for me, but I haven't actually had breakfast or indeed the eight hours of sleep before breakfast. So, <coughs> but, but here I am. Anyway, and uh, there I was last night in Adelaide. This is the only bit of Adelaide that looks like Shenzhen, actually, which um, I, I managed to find <laughs> by mistake. I, I put that there to remind me to say the reason I'm in Australia is I'm on the Integrated Design Commission board in the South Australian government, and uh, thanks to them for bringing me out to Australia. Um, they're doing some of the more interesting work in, in design and policy uh, in Australia at the moment, I think. And thanks also to Uni of Melbourne for getting me here to talk to you tonight. So, um, some strange words up there uh, for this kind of lecture in this kind of place, and hopefully that will become clear. The reason I've, I'm putting that on there is because I want to talk about a vocabulary. So I talk about strategic design, which is an emerging field, I suppose, although it builds on lots of existing work, as ever. And we, we're talking about vocabularies because we need a way of discussing and communicating it. So a lot of this stuff is quite half-formed and new, and uh, these words we're testing in situations like this. Uh, so I need you to tell me if it makes sense afterwards as well. Um, but the vocabulary is about making things legible and helping us understand what's going on as well. So, uh, as was pointed out, I work actually in um, Helsinki. This is Helsinki. Um, and at the moment it's about zero degrees, one, one degree. So that's another big difference with, with coming here. Uh, the strategic designing that sits within Citra, which is the Finnish Innovation Fund, um, which is a strange thing, a good thing, and uh, you should get one here. Uh, it was set up in 1967 as a kind of a birthday present to the nation of Finland, from the nation of Finland. Finland was in, became independent of Russia in 1917. So if on the 50th anniversary, the Bank of Finland put some money aside and said, this money should be a fund for looking after the future of the country, essentially making it economically competitive was the driver at the time. Now we interpret that mission to also include things like sustainable well-being and, and such like. Um, so always had this kind of positioning Finland internationally focus, but doing work for Finland internally. It's independent in that it's self-funded, so that's genuine independence in that sense. Uh, the endowment that it was given in 1967 has grown over time, and we use the interest off that every year to do projects. Um, and make investments. Uh, so it's worked almost as a venture capital firm to some extent, a publicly owned venture capital firm that would fund things before the market was ready to fund them. So I would say, say, renewable energies a few years ago, before you could make a market case for that, Sutra would fund it to help create a market for it. And when there's a market, then Sutra moves out. So, uh, however, please don't ask me anything about venture capital and that side of funding because I know nothing of that. <laughs> um, I'm more in the projects side, which is demonstrating and again creating a market before there is one, but this time through project work. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Citra.fi is where you can find out more. And I thought I'd start on a positive note. Um, and being English, it's not easy to talk about failure, obviously, although we have a lot of them. Uh, but it's not something that comes naturally to us. But I think I'd think start with, because it, it sets up where I hope I'm going, and by talking about things that didn't work, actually. So the first one was a project that uh, got a lot of attention a couple of years ago. This was a, a project for the London Olympics called The Cloud. And the, the Olympics ran a competition for a structure, like a memorial structure, to be at the heart of the Olympic Park. And this was the proposal I worked on with a couple of colleagues at Arup, uh, Carlo Ratti at MIT, um, Atmos in London, and about 15 other firms spread all over the world. Jörg Schleich was doing structural engineering and so on. And uh, so this was to be our, our, our proposal. And it was actually, actually the mayor's favorite proposal, which is a bit of a poison chalice when the mayor is Boris Johnson, because you know, don't really want him to like anything I've ever done. But anyway, um, he, did, he did like it. Uh, it was appealing to him. Uh, it didn't win, though. The one that won is being built now by Anish Kapoor and um, Cecil Bauman actually is, is, is up. But what was the deal here was that uh, it was a, probably the other reason it didn't win is that basically it's a floating bubble structure hovering above the Olympic Stadium. So it's a, it's a slightly ludicrous idea in a way. But, so these bubbles on top of ETFE or PTFE, they're sort of a plastic 
uh, which is acoustically transparent to some extent and visually translucent to some extent, but it's strong and you can build with it. The water cube um, is made of things like that and it sits on these struts and you can uh, climb up or get the elevator up these struts. It gathers the energy from the people walking and cycling up it and uses part of that in the um, elevator. You can't actually sit on the edge like that person at the top is doing. <laughs> Minor health and safety issue, but you know, it's a, it's a competition, so anything goes. And uh, the interesting thing was that, from my perspective, was that uh, it's a giant bubble, right? So you could cover that thing with LEDs. Uh, you, could, you could effectively lace LEDs all the way through it. So the whole thing becomes a giant display and a giant 3D display as well, because it would have depth as well as breadth. So you could actually you could broadcast in 3D on it from certain angles, obviously. So you could run the, the video for the 100 meters final of the scale of this as it's going on inside the stadium, or you could use it for data visualization on a civic scale, so you can make the thing glow red if London's transit network is about to melt down, or um, glow green if the energy consumption of the games is doing okay, or another partner on it was Google, and imagine the data that Google has about London in real time, so where, are, where is London emailing right now, or where are emails coming in to London from? Um, what is London searching for right now? You'd have to filter that to some extent, obviously, but that's easy. So, so this, this becomes data visualization at the civic scale, which is something we're very interested in, not this kind of very personalized idea about data viz where you just get it on your phone or on your laptop, but something that's actually part of a neighborhood or an urban condition of some kind. So it was all interesting, didn't work. Uh, came second. So this one, I don't know where this one came. This was with Super Colossal, who are a great Sydney-based firm for UTS, University of Technology Sydney, for their, I think it was the engineering building, I forget which. Uh, similar idea in a way. So uh, Marcus Trimble did the, um, the architecture, the building design here. But we, we thought, how, how can we make a university building communicate what it is about? Given that universities are about exchange of knowledge and ideas and information, and some of that knowledge and ideas and information is being transmitted over the networks increasingly, we can tap into those networks and reveal the contents of it, again, after suitably filtering, preserving, privacy, anonymity, all the right things that you need to do with any kind of urban system. But you could pull literally the activity of the building onto the outside of the building, essentially. Um, when you walk through a campus, as I just did trying to find this building, it's very difficult to see what the buildings are about. You know, they're very opaque things, actually, whereas inside they're full of life and vitality, ideally, and, and information and knowledge. Um, so in a way, you should know if you're thinking about placemaking and connecting placemaking to production, if you like. You should know what the building is. You should know if you're walking past civil engineering or recreation management or architecture or or chemistry, but there's no way of knowing that with uh, the way that campuses are usually designed. So we designed this to, to pull that data out, to broadcast lectures in real time, to say whether the lecturer is in, obviously they wouldn't be most of the time, but, so, but that kind of valuable public service. Um, what PhD class is going on up there, how many bike spaces are left in the garage and so on, the energy consumption of the building. So again, the life of the building. <coughs> starts to become visible. It's not all the life of the building, obviously. It doesn't capture the essence of chance conversations in the corridor. It doesn't capture phone conversations, nor should it. You know. so, so there's a delicate balancing act about what you can perceive and then what you should try and perceive with these kind of networks. Anyway, this didn't work either. So. Um, Barangaroo isn't really a failure in a sense. I suppose my take on it, when I was working on it with Arup and Roger Stockhaver and Aspect Design, and lend lease and, and many, many others, uh, was that it was tricky because a lot of the things that we wanted to address with the project were already decided and were out of scope, essentially. And you often find this as a designer working on projects like this, that if you're trying to make a sustainable, productive urban development, um, actually a lot of the conditions will be decided by the time you get onto the project. You can't really address some of the initial ideas, which would be very interesting to address because they've been made by some consortium behind the brief writing process. In this case, actually, a strange combination of Barangaroo Development Authority, Paul Keating, New South Wales State Government, the developers, and so on. So it's very difficult to get to grips with any of those decisions that have already been made. What, again, what I was looking at was how do you use uh, data to tell a story about the performance of the site, quite often from a sustainability point of view or sustainable infrastructure point of view. 
So looking at the amount of water flowing through the site, oh, most of that stuff's usually hidden because as engineers we like to hide stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a massive water, underground water tank proposed for Brangaroo, which will filter water and then feed it back up and there'll be, there's some interesting natural filtration systems going on as well. But a lot of those things are hidden through architecture and engineering. And our idea was, well, if we want people to make a connection between the systems that they're using and their behavior in some way, maybe one of the first things we can do is actually expose the behavior of those systems so that you can at least perceive how much water is being collected and how much water is used when you flush the toilet and so on. Um, I have to say, that's not going to get you anywhere in terms of behavior change. <laughs> There's a lot more to do after that, but it's only one step in the process. Um, so these things got taken on to some degree. We talked about uh, pulling information into these lovely landscape structures done by aspect design, building on the idea that ports have always been full of information, so shipping containers are kind of full of data if you look at them through a certain lens, uh, depth gauges, even um, the kind of markings on ships' masts you see at the Museum of Sydney. The, the ports are quite data-rich places, right? Uh, you could make those lighting poles sway in sequence a minute before the ferry. I know that's not a ferry, that's all I have to hand. But um, before the ferry comes in, you could make them basically sway or light up in some way, which at the time you'd read as an interface. So you'd be able to see if there's, a, there's an event about to occur at this bit of the city, and you'd come out to public transport, which is about promoting the, the role of public transit within the site, and so on and so on. So these ideas about making invisible things visible were woven into the project. No, it's not really a failure in a way. They may still be going on. I'm not working on the projects anymore, um, and I hope they are. But the issue at the time was, was that, from the developer point of view, there was no one there to talk to about this kind of stuff, because organizationally there was a mismatch. They didn't employ people who, who know about these kinds of things, so they'd look at that and go, hmm, are you IT? And they go, well, oh, not really. And they go, well, are you an architect? And they go, well, not so much. You know, and it's kind of like, that's all they have. <laughs> Those are the only sockets they've got to plug into. So... So that's really complex. When the, when the condition changes, the organizations lag several years behind that. So that, that became that kind of challenge. So as I say, they may still be in there, but I don't think they are. What's on Mazda? Similar kind of scenario there. United Arab Emirates, obviously, uh, in, the, in the, the, the center with lava um, architects in Sydney and Arab again. Uh, the idea here was to build these structures that uh, during the day open up like a flower and gather energy or through solar energy essentially and then at night they close up as a flower does I suppose which lets some heat rise from the this central plaza into the desert sky um, but again we could also use those to power light so the whole place could become a lighting field in a way which again could talk to the, the invisible movements moving through that so there's an MIT campus just next door, what if we could again talk to the data flowing in and out of that space, but using this as our kind of playing field. And the idea was sort of three separate, four separate lights embedded in, um, in these lighting poles. So again, you could read them as a 3D field as well as viewed from above. That didn't happen either. <laughs> it may be about to happen, I don't know. This, uh, working on Mazda from Australia is a condition of working as a global consultant in this kind of business unbelievably difficult to manage and you never really know whether it's going to happen or not until you actually see the thing built. Sydney Metro is perhaps one of PhD resistance in terms of failed projects. So um, this with the blue line at the top there is the Metro line proposed to Sydney by a couple of premiers back I suppose in Sydney dog years of premier lives. Um, these other dots here are buses and, and train lines that would connect to the Metro. Uh, uh, this is a basic visualization I did with uh, my colleagues at Arab, Jason McDermott in particular, um, making, again, legible Sydney's transport system. Because those things are run independently as privatized concerns, they don't really share data with each other much, and they're not really managed as a system. So it's very difficult to know if you get off the train, is there a connecting bus? This doesn't have the bus data on it, because the bus data is actually so complex and, and rich, uh, you barely see anything else. Um, but the idea here was actually to use it at this kind of scale. So in the, in the station concourse and escalator space, on a projection or a screen of some kind at that scale, so that as you're coming down the escalator, you're kind of drifting by this thing, and it's hovering between public art and interface. It's kind of, you could just look at it at the corner of your eye and go, oh, that's a nice glowing, throbbing thing. 
Uh, or you could actually try and read it and say, okay, forget the Parameta, where's the connecting train and is it running today because this is all real time. So I quite like those things that sit in between. And then it would work at this scale as well and then at this scale too. Same data, three different places. One point of failure there is that it's very difficult to get the uh, organizations involved in these kind of projects to work like that because all of those things I've just shown you are three entirely separate procurements. The, the app on the mobile um, is probably done actually as a marketing thing at the last stage, whereas the station display information is done very early on in a, in a very, very different kind of industry. The one in the middle is a, probably a separate product again procured separately. So the idea of working the same data across all these scales, which is natural if you've built websites for your living, doesn't happen in these kind of environments. So that's again a big kind of organizational cultural shift that needs to happen at some point. The big failure here, though, of course, is that the Premier decided not to do it, ultimately, and um, there was a, I think there was, was a change of Premier, I forget. Yeah, I think Keneally cancelled it after several hundred million dollars worth of spending on the project. So this is where, of course, you understand that these kind of projects are at the behest of political capital. It doesn't actually matter if it's a good idea or not, in a way. Uh, if it's not part of the political agenda of the incoming party, it's not going to happen. So that's why you need to make the project absolutely aligned with political capital, which is not something you get taught at design school much, I would think, but you probably should be. So this work's really difficult, right? <laughs> Doing those kinds of things, and I don't really do those sort of things directly anyway, uh, anymore, um, extremely difficult for a number of reasons, and some of them are um, because of these sort of things, so, you know, cost, inertia, legacy, legacy, complexity, scale, all of those things I've just been talked about, even the language we talk to across those things when it's, when it's working across a boundary, short-termism and decision-making is incredibly difficult when you're doing something like a metro, which has probably got a hundred-year design life, that's 25 political terms, potentially, so... So there's a, there's a mismatch between, say, the political decision-making on something like that and the lifespan of the project, which makes it very difficult. And again, it, to me, it calls the need for an independent, long-term decision-making body of some kind. And that's a separate thing. But um, I throw this up because this is one of my favourite architects from the mid-60s, British architect called Cedric Price, who pointed out that we often spend a lot of time talking about the technology or the solution here without really focusing on the question in the first place. And that was also the problem with a lot of those projects. We weren't addressing the question in the right way, or we couldn't. And so that was part of the reason why they didn't work. The other reason is, as I sort of said, this is from Brick to Papanek's design for the real world. The designer's view of the problem and the share of their influence is quite small. So it's probably, what, 5% or so. And the real problem is addressed actually by other things. And I'll return to that, because that's something that we need to change if we're to make design meaningful, influential, uh, which I think is something we should do. I suppose it's not taken as red that we ought to, but I think, I think it has value. So what I started getting interested in was the cultures of decision-making themselves. Like how do you make decisions about things like sustainable infrastructure when your decision-making apparatus isn't actually in the right uh, state for it, perhaps, or certainly we have different cultures at play. So the culture of decision making in China is quite different to one in Chile, or Finland, or South Africa, or the Victorian state government, or uh, and so on. It's, it's, uh, these are, they all have the different ways of making decisions. We don't really address the way that we make that, but we address the way that we make decisions as a kind of thing in itself, as a practice, if you like. Um, when I've worked on projects that have worked, and occasionally I have, just so you know, <laughs> um, things like the State Library of Queensland, we uh, did some interesting work there, or um, I think actually some stuff with Melbourne C40, I see Matt Wilcox here, who was working with on that, and uh, probably a few others. Um, and it, yes, it, this one didn't achieve the full ring of what we were looking at, but it helped kick off a series of small projects or change at least the conversation internally. It's because we were working internally or close to the heart of the problem and strategically at a relatively um, influential level. <coughs> that made a big difference, uh, being able to get to the client in a meaningful way. And so part of that was to do with, if, it, if we talk about matter being the physical matter of the thing, the library or the, the metro, there's this meta context around it which is the organizational context or the, or the culture that makes the decision about it in some way. 
And so when you're a successful designer, I think it's often because you're able to shift between the matter and the meta. You're able to talk to the client and the organization or the context in some way and make sense of that and see that as part of the design challenge as well as dealing with the physical matter too. So this sense of redesigning the context itself, the organization, the culture, the politics, the, the whatever, the design making process, I think is increasingly cool. Um, but, as it says, there's a, there's a series of even bigger problems kicking around which equally demonstrate this problem of decision making. So I'll just show you, for instance, in the world right now, issues we have around decision making. Okay, so in Athens, there's this kind of thing going on in the streets all the time. That's a failure or a breakdown of decision making one way or another, either between the EU and Greece or within Greece itself. Um, last year in the UK, in London, Birmingham, Manchester, etc., I saw, I saw riots that I'd never seen in my lifetime, um, which are kind of horrifying, actually. And, and, and again, uh, people struggle with the reason why. This seems like an outpouring of frustration without a very clear cause. There's nothing kind of black and white about it as though have been about the riots since, say, 1980, 81, where it was like a minor strike, and you either was minus fighting police and you could kind of see what that was about. This was about, if anything, about 30 years of policies sort of building up to uh, some kind of tipping over some threshold point. Uh, and, you know, people didn't really know what to do about it because how do you, can't, how do you address that? You could go back 30 years and try and do it differently. It's just, you can't actually do it. So the decision making around it gets incredibly complex. Then, of course, the Occupy everywhere movement, um, again, demonstrates a problem around decision making. I mean, this, this was all in last year's kind of peak news year of <laughs> everything happening simultaneously. Decision making uh, between these two in Brussels actually is tighter than almost any, any of the others uh, around that particular table. You can see that's quite fraught between uh, Mercosi and Sarkozy, or <laughs> Mercosi, or as they're kind of... <laughs> Combined, to, I keep saying her name as if it's the combined name. Um, in Washington, uh, John Berner and Barack Obama can't even look at each other. Um, so it's very difficult for them to make decisions institutionally in some way. Uh, Moscow, you see demonstrations all over the place. Cairo, the Arab Spring, there were numerous places. Last year we saw that going on as well. And these are, these are crises right at the heart of our understanding of civilization. <coughs> this could not be more fundamental. Um, Italy and Greece now run by unelected technocrats. So, you know, Italy and Greece are sort of the two of the foundations of European civilization. In a way. And on the European scale, they're now run by people that weren't elected in any way. So, the very nation of, notion of democracy <coughs> itself is being uh, implicitly, I'd say, attacked by this kind of maneuver. This is just data of, I mean, you, you don't need to know the numbers in a way here, but this is people reporting confidence in their national government. Uh, South Asia, advanced economies, East, Southeast Asia, and Pacific. I'm not sure whether Australia fits into advanced economies or Pacific. Take your pick. Anyway, it's not good. So, uh, confidence dropping everywhere except sub Saharan Africa, which is probably starting from a relatively low base. <laughs> um, change in the risk of social unrest going up as a result. So those things swing together. This is from Gallup World Poll data. This was from before last year. This is 2010. So before all that stuff I just showed you. So uh, I don't know the answer why. <laughs> just before you go, oh God, I hope he's got the answer. Because no, no, you're going to leave in frustration because it's, it's clearly far too complex and wide-reaching and there's something quite fundamental going on here. It's something to do with the collision of all of these things. And these are the kind of addressing uh, questions that we're trying to ad address in our work, and I guess a lot of us are all addressing, uh, which are now an entirely new nature of challenge, actually, I think we can say. Climate change in particular is so complex compared to what we've had to deal with before. Um, but the, the others are anything to do with the welfare state is massively under threat, as you know, because of aging population, amongst other things, as well as changes in attitudes. Economic development and fiscal policy is in crisis. Um, aging population, a lot in particular in the Western world. Uh, immigration, urbanization, the nature of democracy and so on. 
uh, that list is almost greyed out because it's so familiar and we've seen it so many times and you know sometimes it's called wicked problems which I don't say because it makes me think of Ali G but um, <laughs> they are they're certainly complex problems so uh, the problems aren't clear is one of the issues that they're not really defined neatly for us in any way we can't really decide even actually how to talk about climate change meaningfully uh, they're incredibly interdependent so it's no longer just the province of the Department of Health say to look after health it's clearly also to do with planning, because if you walk more than you drive, then you're probably going to be healthier, but not if you're walking past some uh, chemical site, which is putting toxins into you the whole time. So that, that's, that's a planning issue, but it's also a health issue. It's also the province of education. It's also to do with what you eat, and so on and so on. It's, it's no longer one department's job to look after things in this very clear definition sort of set that we had before. And the same applies to any one of those previous problems. There isn't, there isn't a client quite often. There's no real client for climate change right, except the entire human race. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to go to the client in the right way. Sometimes you have to make it up. It's beyond process improvement because of that interdependency. So we won't just get better returns on healthcare, say, just by looking at what the Department of Health does and making them better at being the Department of Health because it's also to do with education and planning and uh, personal decisions and so on and culture. And there's a massive gap between policy and delivery. So this, is, this gets a bit policy geek, but in the Western world in particular, although probably broadly actually, um, policy is set by people that are usually policy makers, and it's entirely separate bunch of people that end up delivering on the end of those things. And they're really different worlds, and there's not very good connections between them at all. Uh, so the people making policy around, say, health, um, rarely spend enough time in waiting rooms, for instance, or hospital environments or emergency situations and so on. It's not something that they practice in terms of the way they make decisions. Now partly I'd say these are design decisions in themselves. So, you know, I would say that I'm a designer, so of course I see it as design decisions. But by which I mean we have decided one way or another to make the world in this fashion. Now we may not have done that fully consciously <laughs> uh, or we may not have seen it as a series of interconnecting things which add up to something that was bigger than the sum of the parts, admittedly. No one really probably thought about climate change in 1750 when they started smelting things in a different way uh, and thought, oh, bloody hell, in 250 years, that's going to cause a problem for my great, 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 great granddaughter. But that's what's happened. They, they, they have been, these are human activities, right? There hasn't been anybody else involved in these decision making except us. Now, part of that issue now is that we have the wrong decision making apparatus. I'd argue, in that, this is my boss, Marco, this is Marco Steinberg, we've got 18th century institutions facing 21st century problems, so by which we can actually probably talk about education, seeing as we're here. Um, so we have faculties and departments along, aligned in very similar lines to the 18th century one way or another, I would argue. I mean, we may have changed the names a few times, but they're working in a similar way. Not different enough, put it that way. Certainly uh, government is the same, we have similar departments, again this idea around expertise and analysis which comes from a very sort of post-enlightenment position on the way that we would make a decision and these are a slightly different nature of problem that aren't being um, addressed correctly by that approach. So w more data and more analysis isn't helping us move forward necessarily in all of those things, there's something else that's required there. So, what our work now is looking at decision-making itself, and particularly public decision-making, so particularly the relationship between governments and citizens, so the social contract, and, and seeing that as a design challenge, which is, you know, full marks for arrogance and hubris, but there you go. Um, that's where we think the issue is now. If we can make a better culture of decision-making, maybe we can make better decisions. So I'll just take you through them quickly, the, the, the kind of vocabulary that we're playing with. So this, this is where we talk some more about the projects, but I try and just group them into concepts, almost like a kind of a playbook in sports or something. Not because I want you to say, oh, that's great, I can copy and paste that into my work, although if you do, then please do and tell us now how you, let us know how you get on. We try and be very explicit about all of this stuff as much as possible. Everything goes online, we're public, there's no reason why we would keep anything back. So we'd like to understand if any of you do take these ideas forward and tell us how you go with them. But um, they're there really as a, as, a, as a way of communicating. So the first thing we talk about, which I won't talk about much, here, is the idea of the design studio um, as a sort of an approach to thinking about decision making and, and working with decision makers in a different way. 
So those of you that work in a design environment will be familiar with the idea of the studio. The studio is a place where you work together and make something, but also the studio as a kind of a process of proposal and synthesis and crits and so on. And a studio also as a firm, as a group of people that come together to do something, usually multidisciplinary. And we use the studio to sketch the architecture of the problem because that, again, in terms of Cedric, Cedric Price's first thing is often not understood enough. The way that the problem fits together, we jump up to the solution far too quickly most of the time without really looking at actually what's the bigger architecture there? How is healthcare actually mapped out as a, as, a, as a system? I don't mean system in a technical sense, I just mean as a, we talk about it as the way that the problem fits together, if you like, as an architecture. <coughs> So, and when we're doing this, we prefer synthesis over analysis, and this is one of the tools designers do have in their toolkit. Not exclusively, lots of other people can do synthesis too, but, uh, but again, I'm a designer, so I'm going to talk about it. Uh, synthesis is different to analysis. Analysis tells you the why things are, the way things are, whereas synthesis proposes the way things they could be based on that analysis in some way. Because so it actually produces something, and it's synthetic in that sense. So it's quite useful, actually, in a problem-solving context around those kind of problems I just talked about because it's, it starts the conversation off on a different foot altogether. Instead of presenting analysis as to why, it actually takes that analysis and weaves it together in some way. So think sort of a multidisciplinary <coughs> synthesis uh, that suggests something that you can then talk about and kick around and test in some way in the spirit of asking the right questions in the first place. And um, we made a little book about this which you can download as a as a PDF. Um, I should have, we're not musicians. We are. <laughs> As you can tell. So this is all available online. There are physical, physical copies kicking around that you can download this for free. It, it, it describes a way of <coughs> collaborating. Actually skip for a bit. And it describes some studios that we ran around, education, aging, and sustainability in particular, and this idea of a manual that you can actually draw from as well. So please have a look at that and, and tell us what you think. It's at HelsinkiDesignLab.org. Um, second idea then is stewardship. Actually, this is, this is about connecting that kind of policy to delivery breakdown. So something else that we do when we're working as designers, ideally, is we, we work on a project from start to finish all the way through to realization, as in you're working from a blank piece of paper, and ultimately you end up with uh, an iPhone or a building or a train or a dress or something. So, so you're, you're actually capable of rolling it through that and often in, the, in this kind of fulcrum position in between multiple stages of the projects when marketing engages, when engineering engages, when strategy engages, when the finance engages and so on. And I think this is absolutely key in terms of closing this policy gap, this problem here. And it's something we could, again, borrow from the language of design and bring into public policy and governance to connect policy to projects. Um, a project that we're doing, that we're working on in Helsinki, which demonstrates this, is something called low to no, which is low carbon to no carbon. It talks about a transitional strategy for an urban development. It's a mixed-use urban development. This is what the site looks like now. Something like the moon, basically. Um, which is a former port in Helsinki, which has been flattened, which is close to the center, and in a few years it'll have lots of buildings on it. This is, this is our building. It's a, this is still um, design stages. The architects are Sabra Hutton, German architects, uh, Arab are the engineers and, and other consultants on it. And I worked on the Arab team, and now I work on the client side, because Citro is the client for this, along with SRV, which is a property developer, sort of the Finnish equivalent of Lendlease, I guess. Um, the mind boggles there. But, um, and then uh, VVO, a social housing operator, uh, which is the Finnish equivalent of nothing in Australia. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so there's three clients, of which we're one. So it's commercial, mixed use, uh, residential, retail, there's public spaces in there. Um, uh, we'll move our HQ in there, so we're the client in a very meaningful sense, I think which is kind of interesting, and we designed the procurement around it. <coughs> that was our sort of, that was our, the strategic design environment, was designing the way the procurement happened. Yeah, the design is done by external architects. So let, let me unpack what is going on there a bit. One thing we're doing with this building is seeing it as a Trojan horse. So the idea, obviously, from 
uh, Greek mythology about sneaking in all kinds of strategies into something that looks like something else. So, for instance, a good chunk of the building will be timber, solid timber using this compressed laminate timber, which you're beginning to see some stuff got in Australia, I think, with this. So it's, it's structural elements of timber, as well as its facades, every, every part of it, essentially. It's, um, you know, it's as good as concrete or steel in that sense. It's better, obviously, in that it locks up carbon for a very long time because it's timber. It doesn't really burn. Um, so it's actually less problematic than concrete and steel in, in some respects. It's aesthetically pleasing and so on. So that's that. That's a nice thing. But uh, the reason we're interested in that in particular is because the, the second biggest industry in Finland behind ICT stuff is forestry timber, and for, because basically Finland is 98% forests, uh, forests and lakes, I guess. And um, most of that industry has been about paper and pulp products, and that's all moving south to the equator, to Malaysia and places where the trees go quicker and the labor costs are cheaper. So Finland needs a new trajectory for its forestry business, so timber construction material could be a perfect trajectory for it. It's low carbon, it builds on the existing and highly advanced logistics networks that the Finnish company have set up around the paper business and so on. So what we're doing with making the timber building is actually um, it's about a trajectory for the Finnish forestry business. So yes, it's a timber construction innovation in a sense. It'll be the first one in Finland. Um, but it's really about the fact that also strategically that would be quite good from the country's um, GDP point of view or employment point of view, more specifically. We're also sneaking in behavioural change stuff, a lot of urban informatics things. So we worked with a great firm called Experientia in Turin who have made these, um, these, are, these are early demos. They're slightly over complex actually, but this is kind of advanced smart meter stuff or an advanced bill which drives down uh, energy consumption and other resource consumption and actually increases social interaction as well and things like this. So it, it's quite nice in a way in that it, the nice stuff in particular is when it pulls that stuff into the context of social interactions. So that's when it becomes more meaningful, I think. We're also looking at making that at uh, the physical scale. So home delivery systems that ping you on your mobile when your food is being delivered into a sort of a concierge-like service of the lobby of each apartment block. Um, shared social notice board thing, these would be touch screens, but actually built as part of the architecture, so not just a, a screen slapped on the side of the building afterwards. So again, this is, this is Arab work, um, but for Citra. Um, using participatory design methods was a way of changing the way the Finnish architecture business works, actually not just Finnish. So using the, the language of user-centered design from web design and mobile app design, and drawing that into architecture. Um, changing the way the thing is managed. There are some particular issues in Finland with the way that buildings are managed, as in you have to have people that climb up onto the roof and clear snow off every now and then. These poor, poor chaps are in, in inevitably probably Estonians who are come across and they're called snow droppers in the language and they climb up there and clear that off in the, in the depths of winter. So the way that buildings are managed and those kinds of service services, still being basically done in the way they were in the 60s. So we're innovating in that as well. And that's something, that, again, that's replicable across lots of other buildings, not just this one. So the idea here is no more one-offs with buildings. Every building has the opportunity to innovate across all those axes and many more, but they very rarely do. They're partly because the business model so constrains the designers on it that there's no room for maneuver, partly because the designers constrain themselves through their own practices. Um, but imagine that every building could generate multiple uh, benefits elsewhere. There's no reason why the informatics stuff couldn't be disengaged from that and actually would benefit through network effects from being spread to multiple other buildings. The timber construction obviously benefits other things other than buildings, in fact. Another idea, the, uh, the MacGuffin. This is about getting things done. The MacGuffin you see in the first film about spies. This is a thing that the spies are after. In the days of Ratchet Kipling, it will be the plans of the fort on the Kyber Pass. It will be the plans of an airplane to war. And the plans of an American bomb living in Iraq. It's always called the thing that the characters on the screen worry about, but they only don't care. 
So I was Alfred Hitchcock, I aspire to sound like that <laughs> one day. Um, so the thing that the characters on the screen care about but the audience don't care, I mean, I'd argue actually a lot of uh, buildings are a bit like that when you're in the design phase, you're obsessing over the details of it. The audience, actually, which is the people that move into it, don't really care about things like joists and spandrels and timber details and things. They're, they're, it's more what does it do for them. They care about actually their story about what they're going to do with it. But more importantly, this is about motivation and how do you get things done in the first place? How do you drive the plot? So Hitchcock would always start a movie with the MacGuffin, the thing that had to kick the whole thing off and motivate everybody to get involved in a story. And then he discarded it quite quickly. So Cary Grant was talking about government plans, secret government plans. You never actually find out what they are in North by Northwest because it actually becomes about something else entirely. And you're only really caring about the characters and what's going on there. He used that excuse as a way to get you into another story. So how do we generate the motivation behind something? And with the, with the timber story, I think this is, this is really key. You have to make the thing. You have to make the building to change, uh, the, and actually in this case, the regulations around timber building, which I'll come on to in a second. In order to do a timber building, uh, we had to change the building codes in Helsinki. The building codes prevented a timber building at that scale being built. Um, because they've been written largely in the 19th century and been updated a couple of times. But if you built a timber building of 10 stories in the 19th century, people would look at you funny because it would, build, it would burn down pretty quickly. So it just that was for Bowen. Um, we had to change that in order to enable us to do the timber building, in order to enable us to, again, work with the forestry industry. But no, no amount of PowerPoint presentations wouldn't, uh, would have had generated enough motivation to change that building code, I can tell you now. There have been consultants doing that for many years saying, timber buildings, come on. <laughs> and they wouldn't have made the slightest job. In fact, they didn't, right? You know, Finland's sitting on this timber industry, which is actually beginning to export timber as a construction material to other countries like Germany and Austria without them being built in Finland. So this means engaging with dark matter. And I talk about dark matter drawn from Bauto Vanstifut, who not only has a great name, but is a great person. He's an architectural historian in Rotterdam. And skip all of that, but he talks about, if you really want to change the city, you've got to, to re-engage with the structures and the institutions, the horribly complex dark matter. So you've got to, the things that run the city, actually, or run part of the city. Now, dark matter, don't read pejoratively like dark as in scary. Just think of it in terms of theoretical physics as, you know, the way you can just say that, um, uh, as you do. So dark matter is really uh, everything around us that we can't perceive that makes the things that we can perceive exist. It's one of those theoretical physics things you want. So 83% of the known universe is dark matter. We're in that 17%. Everything around that you can perceive is in the 17%. It couldn't exist without the 83%. No one's ever seen it. There's no way of seeing it. But it must be there for the rest of it to exist. So, I quite like this phrase that he had. Um, Fritz Zwicky in 1934 talked about the missing mass. There must be something else there which is causing everything to happen. So, if you like, uh, like if you take an iPhone, this is, the, this is the physical matter, this is the 17%. But this is a product of many things which you can't perceive. So, Apple's organizational culture, the way that it handles its production processes, uh, its patent portfolio, fending off other companies, its deals with the music industry and the film industry that enable iTunes to work, which enables this to work, uh, and so on and so on. It's logistics networks. And, uh, all of that stuff enables you to have the thing that is apparently seamless and smooth in the hand. All of that stuff you can't perceive. You, that would not exist without the other stuff. So this is really making a case, again, for seeing that as part of the design of the challenge. I'd argue that actually that's kind of how Apple see it. That's why it works so well, is they see all of that stuff at the same time. They start every process with all of those things around the table working it through together. So this is this idea about designing the context again and designing between the matter and the meta. The physical matter and the, the meta around it. So the matter can unlock meta. <laughs> Bear with me. So you know, you know, a building can enable uh, a series of activities within it, which is meta if you like. You can go the other way. I said a cup of tea with Marcus Westbury, who's in Brunswick, and uh, he did this great project in Newcastle, New South Wales, which some of you will probably know, which utterly transformed the downtown of Newcastle from this largely derelict space, actually, in, a, in about 200 buildings, into getting them occupied and full and active again. And he did that through changing the leasing structure on them. So he worked with the building owners, he and his colleagues, and said, 
Uh, mate, you're not going to get that four-year lease from Coles that you're looking for ever again. Um, what about, well, I know a bunch of people that would use this space and they'll do it up and they'll make it active there, uh, but they can't afford the amount of lease that you're looking for. They can afford 30 days because they're that kind of thing. But we can, let's set up a rolling 30-day lease. And so they got artists, entrepreneurs, creative industries, and so on um, into the space who could afford to pitch ahead 30 days. Then they get to the end of 30 days, naturally they renew the lease and do another 30 days and so on. It's great from the owner's point of view because if someone bigger does come along, they can kick out the starving artist. They've got less than 29 days to, to wait usually. Um, but it's actually what happens, of course, is that they just keep on rolling. And this space is now utterly transformed. There are, there are 80, I think, buildings now occupied, where there were 200 derelict before. There are activities there, festivals and so on. It's been done with basically just a kind of a smattering of Wi-Fi and a stroke of paperwork over a leasing structure. No physical infrastructure whatsoever. So it's kind of very interesting from an architecture and planning point of view. You can transform a city just by changing some legal paperwork. Should we take that on again as part of the design challenge? So there's a tradition there in a way. Saarinen, the great Finnish architect, um, not from Lord of the Rings, said, always design a thing by considering in its next larger context, a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in the environment, environment in a city plan and so on. Always look to the next one up. I mean, now we might argue you have to kind of zoom from the chair to the city plan. <laughs> We're talking about these kind of issues, but, but still, that was an interesting idea. I think you can go the other way. You can design the context by considering the thing it's supposed to produce, and you have to do that a bit. To so make a transformational product, like an iPhone or, or a timber building at 12 stories, you have to change the context, you have to change the organization to some degree. For it to be replicable, that is. You can always do a one-off, but to make it replicable, to do systemic change, that's a different thing. So, now let's talk about decision-making again. Um, the idea of the platform is big in the last five, ten years, okay, in business, in business language. So the platform is something like iTunes, again, which enables this to work so well. Uh, it has these conditions and many others. There's many books you can read about it. There's one called Kickstarter. Who knows Kickstarter? Just out of interest, anybody? So about 30% of the people. So Kickstarter is a, a crowdfunding platform, essentially, where you can propose a project and people will make a small donation, anything from a dollar up, to make it happen. And you get a gift back in return. So if you're proposing a book and you give them $1,000, then your name will be one of the characters' names <laughs> in the story and so on. So, so far, so blah. But this thing is enormous now, and it's... Uh, an, it's changing the way that actually culture gets funded in the US in good ways and bad ways. It's raised more money now than the National Endowment for the Arts did, hundreds of millions of dollars last year. So the traditional federal funding for arts and culture is X hundred million dollars. Kickstarter's raised more than that now. Uh, and, and it's maybe like two or three years old. So it's, what it's tapped into is this amazing ability to get behind something and organize very quickly using these new platforms. Where it falls over, is when somebody proposed uh, a Kickstarter project of a statue of Robocop to be built outside Detroit City Hall in Detroit. Um, now that raised $58,000 of funding to pay for a concept study in about three days. <laughs> it just went gangbusters. But it didn't happen because the mayor didn't want it to happen. And I kind of agree with them. If there's $58,000 kicking around to spend in Detroit, in Detroit in the state that it's in, we'll probably spend it better than as much as I like Robocop, let's spend it better than that. Secondly, who decides this question? So some of the people contributing from the UK or France, right? And some of them, there was a great article in Domus about it. Some of them saying, oh yeah, I'd love to see a Robocop statue in Detroit. That'd be well wicked. You know, it's, like, it's just, what are you doing? You know, who's to say what happens in your downtown? Why, why can some nomarch in Britain give $10 to a Detroit Robocop statue that might or might not happen in in Detroit, and there's people starving on the streets, potentially. You know, it's sort of, it's just really odd because you've got this kind of long tail of geography playing out on this idea of long tail of crowdfunding, but they're kind of orthogonal to each other. There's no agreed culture for making a local decision using that kind of funding platform. So we're doing a project called Brickstarter, which gets to how do we use that kind of uh, crowdfunded, uh, self-organizing principle behind those kind of networks, but use it for physical spaces. So say there's a vacant plot you walk past every day. Well, that could be a community garden. It could have solar cells on it. It could have 
shopping centre on it. Could it, you know, it could be any number of things. How would you propose something? Get your friends behind it. Ag aggregate some attention behind it. Get to the stage where it become a proposal and then a product. This is partly to do with reversing the polarity from uh, NIMBY to YIMBY, or indeed WIMBY, or PIMBY. <laughs> um, NIMBY is not in my backyard. YIMBY is yes in my backyard. WIMBY is welcome in my backyard, which is a book by Wouter, who I mentioned earlier. PIMBY is please in my backyard. There's another one there. You can see there's something occurring here where the system at the moment uh, of, part of, kind of consultation between government and citizen actually generates the NIMBY position as often as not. It's a, it's a reason to say no or to complain because usually it's a planning decision which we go to the citizens with and say, here's the light rail, what do you reckon? And they go, oh, oh I'm not so sure actually. Well, uh, mm, I say no. Uh, and that happens most of the time. Actually, uh, that's the general response because it's a system designed to do that inadvertently. What if there was a system that could enable the community to suggest ideas, take them forward to a certain stage, and then integrate with government, you reverse again the entire conversation around it because it's taken the citizens forward, which is, again, the best way of getting anything done, as you know, is to make it their idea, not your idea. You're working kind of with the grain rather than against it in that sense. So we've been going to bits of Finland looking at case studies for this. Hamina on the eastern side... Um, where there's some wind turbines got up, we went to talk to the local journalist, we went to talk to a politician, we talked to the local energy company, we talked to the residents association head there to understand how this wind turbine and a couple of others got up in this place. This is us driving in the forest and getting lost looking for them actually, so quite hard to find. Uh, not that you believe it. Um, and then we've been to Hergsara, which is in western Finland, on the Swedish end of things, and you get this kind of ferry across. Um, and you can just see on the left there, there's a turbine there. There's three wind turbines on this island. There's eight people. This is probably the highest wind turbines per capita <laughs> in the world. Uh, so how did that happen? You know, kind of, it's kind of extraordinary. Now, this one's particularly interesting. Again, we talked to the politician the guy that got them out, the journalist and some way, we're actually trying to find a NIMBY person that's very difficult to find them because they're very suspicious to the way you're talking to them. So we have to pretend, I think. But this gets to this really complex position. The murky is finished for a summer cottage. So the summer cottage, lots of people have them in Finland and they go, they're usually on the coast or a lake. And uh, lots of people go there in the summer for a month, all of July, it's usually taken off, going, people going to summer cottages and then throughout the summer months. They're everywhere where those wind turbines were. The resident population that are there 12 months a year uh, used to be fishing communities for hundreds, thousands of years. The Baltic's now so polluted you can't use it for fishing anymore, so really they need uh, economic resilience of some description, so some of that service industry, but that also means energy resilience. They are now massively in favour of turbines, the people that live there all year round, and they're starting to say things like, we've always been powered by the wind, actually, for hundreds of years we've used wind as our main resource, and we find them very aesthetically pleasing and so on. The murky owners, not so much. The summer cottage owners see it as a kind of a blot on the landscape. It interferes with their idea of what a natural environment should be, which is why they're there, which is, of course, ironic, because they're in a summer cottage which is not part of the natural environment. But anyway, these are the deep ironies at the heart of this decision-making culture, and it gets right to the core of individual and community. Who decides what to do? Again, if you're only there a month a year, can you stop the person that's there 12 months a year? being economically and energy resilient in some sense. I mean, at the moment, they can. Uh, so this probably needs to be recalibrated in some way, but this is going to be very delicate territory, as you can imagine. So again, it's to do with cultures of decision-making. Now, I'd, I'd argue that the problem with uh, a lot of this social network-based rhetoric around organisations, self-organising systems and so on, <laughs> is that they won't work, actually, for mm -hmm. when it comes to organizing anything at some scale or meaningful. They're, they're actually easy to organize a rebellion or to, to take something down, but it's very difficult to use them to put something up in their place. And this is because they don't deal with politics and power. And I'll just play with a short clip. Um, this kind of goes to the, uh, the, the idea of smart cities and using social networks to underpin decision making. The failure of the commune and the fate of the revolutions show the limitations of the self-organizing model. Cannot deal with the central dynamic forces of human society, politics and power. The hippies took up the idea of the society because they were disillusioned with politics. 
They believed that this alternative way of ordering the world was good because it was based on the underlying order of nature. But this was a fantasy. In reality, what they adopted was an idea taken from the cold and logical world of the machines. Now, in our age, we are all disillusioned with politics. And this machine organizing principle has risen up to become the ideology of our age. But what we are discovering is that if we see ourselves as components of a system, then it is very difficult to change the world. It is a very good way of organizing things, even rebellion, but it offers no ideas about what comes next. And just so Curtis is doc- that was Adam Curtis, a BBC documentary maker. It's well worth watching. All, mis- all watched over by machines of loving grace. He totally unpicks the idea of self-organising systems. And as he said, it doesn't tell us what to replace them with. This is the issue. And, and uh, in Finland, where the social cont- contract is actually quite strong, the relationship between citizen and government is not quite as fractured as it is, say, in the UK or Australia or the US. You have to take that into account and work with it. It just means working with it in terms of cultures, not systems, because systems rhetoric all too quickly falls apart. So the the idea of ecosystems even, or ecological thinking applied, is actually also flawed in the way that Curtis also picks apart. So, and final project, calibrating the Nordic model, just to keep ramping up. Um, If we talk about the Nordic model as a diagram, (laughs) this is the dumbest diagram in my toolkit. the spirit level comes from uh, Richard Wilkinson and uh, Kate, no, Kate Wilkinson and Richard Pickett's book, The Spirit Level. So he talks about the social democratic models in Sweden and Norway and Finland and so on. Well, they managed to pull off this amazing trick, in a way, of uh, uh, strong economies, strong entrepreneurships. So the biggest furniture retailer in the world, IKEA, the biggest fashion retailer in the world, H&M, biggest mobile phone manufacturer in the world, Nokia and so on. All of those and met Lego and so on, just hard and Volvo, blah, blah, blah. As well as amazing income equality, the best education system in the world, fully 99% public and free, which seems almost unbelievable. Um, and you get this kind of spirit level where everybody is well educated, everybody's income is largely the same, and you get amazing benefits from that, actually, as a result. However, when everybody's education is largely the same, what happens when the culture starts changing and becoming more diverse? Can you still maintain that in some way? Uh, you'd argue that maybe the food is actually all the same, and actually also not very nice as a result sometimes. <laughs> uh, the architecture is good to averagely good. Not that that really matters in a way compared to, say, education, you'd argue, but there's no exceptional architecture within it. It's all kind of good to average. Healthcare, likewise, it's all good to average. There's nothing exceptional about it. So... As a system, it's actually potentially not that resilient because it's all one thing. It's quite sort of uh, limited in its range of experience. If you took a look at the Anglo model, let's so say UK, you're arguably Australia, I should be careful what I say, um, much more diverse. So in the US, you get a Harvard and a Yale and a Princeton, but most people drop through the floor in terms of low quality education. You get the best healthcare in the world and the worst, and actually very low median level across all. You get some exceptional architecture, you get a lot of dross, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And so these are the dumbest diagrams I have. <laughs> Reducing an entire country down to a squiggly line. But, uh, bear with me. So, what I'm interested in really is positioning that, not because I think that's an accurate reflection of the way things are, but to throw out this question about what is a system that can absorb diversity in some way. And particularly in Finland, this is of interest to us because it's been a homogenous culture for a very long time and is now diversifying quite rapidly. It needs to understand how to absorb diversity into the system in a positive way. So our axis for this is actually street food, funnily enough. So street food is great because it throws all of these things up and many more. Um, Street food in Helsinki has been dominated by this thing called the grilli. There are only two official kinds of street food in Helsinki, the grilli, which is the hot dog stand, and yatsuki, which is ice cream kiosk. There's hot dogs and ice cream, that's it. Uh, these are her officially sanctioned places. They're kind of industrial machines for disseminating hot dogs into drunk people. Uh, it's as if they're designed to be hosed down. It's that kind of you know, scenario. They make these unbelievably grotesque things called 
Macara pedanat, which is sort of like meat and potato. It is actual size, by the way. Um, and, and it's kind of, you know, they're like 46% meat in the meaty bit. And that kind of, although, as the chef pointed out to me the other day, we're all supposed to be eating less meat, so maybe that's good. But, uh, yeah, no, not really. So, the, and then the rest of it's kind of garlic and sauce here to take the taste away, and it's just unbelievable. This man, uh, <laughs> this guy's only 15. And, you know, the, the effects of this thing... You don't know whether he's vomiting or eating. It's like, it's like something's going in or coming out. I don't know. It's, um, there's all kinds of litter and uh, side effects of these. These are my. This is part of my epic series of films about rappers on the street. <laughs> um, this is actually a pool of vomit in the foreground, which are blurred out for your sensitivities. But the thing is, of course, because it's Helsinki. Um, everything's clean again by 8 o'clock utterly spotless because <laughs> the municipal services are so good you don't actually see the problem ever unless you're out on the street uh, it's designed for a certain thing so this is my friend uh, my colleague Brian's diagram restaurants are in red this is opening hours in red and then urban drunkenness level is probably blue um, that's an anecdote all whereas this is actual data so there's not much overlap so if you're, if you're getting really, if you're drunk, then you've really only got the grillies to work with. There's no other way of eating and drinking <laughs> together. So. However, so that's the official view. The unofficial thing that happened last year is this amazing thing called Ravintola Paiva, which means restaurant day. Ravintola, uh, it's restaurant and Paiva is day. There you go. There's some Finnish for you. You knew, you'd learned something tonight. So this means a pop-up restaurant day. What happened was that some people got so frustrated with how tricky it was to open a restaurant because there's so much bureaucracy and forms to fill in and legislation to deal with. They said, sorry, we're not going to do that. Let's just declare a day where anybody can open a restaurant. And it means, you know, you can, you can do it in a park, you can do it out of your window, you can make whatever you like on that day. It was kind of like a set of instructions, if you like, and they just posted it on a website, you'd Facebook to organize it. The first day it happened, there were 40 pop-ups. The next day, six months later, were the 200 many other cities around Finland. The third one was many more than that and cities all over the world. It's entirely illegal. <laughs> uh, from the city's point of view, there's no legislation that covers this condition of people selling stuff out of their window um, or, you know, just on the street selling like this uh, or this guy using these old army soup kitchens to sell soup and so on. This is, um, this is all illegal. <laughs> Because, again, Helsinki is very tightly controlled in that respect, and it's highly organized like that, because there was a certain idea around what Finnishness was and what Finnish use of public space was and what Finnish street food should be, grilly or yatsky, ice cream, hot dogs. And this bust it wide open, so you could get Thai food, you could get flat whites, you could get frog's legs, you could, you know, everything was there. It's kind of extraordinary. And I guess why this street food is interesting, because it gets to the heart of who decides what public space is used for and what can it be used for. And indeed, actually, in Helsinki, when it freezes the sea, you don't even know where the city is sometimes. Like, the sea actually becomes something you can use as well. And again, for centuries, people used to have temporary kind of eating places out on the ice. That's all ice in the background. That's sea ice. So, except the tree. Uh, there's a tradition of the herring fair and street food, uh, which goes about hundreds of years, um, like that guy does. But, and then the 52 Olympics kind of blew it open as well. But at the same time, you had a very, you had prohibition in the 30s. And throughout the 1950s, a woman wasn't allowed to go to a restaurant on her own. So she had to be uh, accompanied by a man. And in fact, the bar stool was banned in the 50s and 60s because it would clearly encourage licentious behavior, <laughs> as in enable women to sit on their own at bars. I mean, that's kind of... That's the environment it was. So this is where Rio Vintola Pile has been this kind of explosion of color and diversity within that. Um, the kiosks are massively underused and could be reused. And again, Rio Vintola Pile offered solutions for that that the city just had never got round to. But what wasn't happening was any closing of this gap between the two. So this is the self organizing system again here. And the city couldn't close it down. And again, it broke all of the laws, but what are they going to do? They, it's a, basically a set of instructions, and you can't arrest a set of instructions. You know, it's, a, it's just there. There's no organization. It's using Facebook. You know? What do they do? So eventually, the, one of the politicians, and a smarter one, went onto the Facebook page and just said, have, have a nice day. And that was that. That's all he could do, because it would be the world's worst PR disaster, PR disaster to try and scoop it all up into the back of them. So, and now, of course, it's become this Helsinki innovation in the way that you know, Sydney always claims Earth Hour. Um, but they can't really talk about it because it's still illegal. So 
the marketing people are kind of chomping at the bit to get behind it, but it's, it's so stuck in the dark matter of the way the city handles food. So we're trying to work in the space there. We, we're going to work in a former wholesale market <coughs> here. Uh, this is actually a, a, a pig processing space. Those things have pigs wheeling around on them. It's a pig circus in Finnish. Um, to make a kind of a startup camp for food entrepreneurs and rewire the dark matter a bit so to, to narrow the gap between that uh, self-organizing world and the, the dark matter of the city. And as I said, it's not really about getting a nicer pizza on the street corner or a falafel or something, although that would be nice. Um, it's about the fact that food covers all of these things. It covers carbon, logistics, health, diversity, entrepreneurship, public space. And so it's all wrapped up in a complex system like food. And food's great because it's so everyday that if you change it, people experience change quite quickly, potentially. It's something you have to make a decision about three or four times a day, at least. Everybody has to. And people find it easier to have qualitative conversations about food, I'd argue, than other things, like urban space, for instance. So that's about what the city is for, who the city is for, how we decide that. It's all wrapped up in street food. This is Ravin to Lepiva again. And the idea is, again, taking it from the left-hand side of the page, from the intervention and the self-organized bit, into something more systemic. So that the day after restaurant day, there's some residue. The day after restaurant day now, there's no trace that it was there. Because, again, it's all very clean and that's it. Nothing's changed. The laws haven't changed. There's no more restaurants in the city than there were two days before. So we need to make these things systemic rather than just interventions, or no more one-offs. So back to that diagram, how do we generate those spikes of innovation? Uh, building on the increased interest in participation, uh, but without wrecking what's good about the social democratic government and the social contract. So how do you kind of maintain that high line of experience and... and uh, uh, delivery, if you like, but unable you to innovate above it in some way? Would that be kind of an augmented spirit level model? To get to that, you can't just do interventions. And most, as I say to any architects here, most buildings are interventions in that they're one-offs. There's not much transfer from one to another, unfortunately. So just finally, then, these kind of systems we're talking about, there's, there's the classic centralized system, which is government usually, and then there's this distributed web, which is the way you describe things like Kickstarter or Facebook or social media and so on. Uh, the internet generally, actually. Um, now, some have described this as actually the horizontalist stuff. So in a political sense, that's described as horizontalist quite often. So the Arab Spring was a horizontalist movement as opposed to hierarchical. And this book is very good on that, actually. I was just, was just reading it on the plane from Adelaide this morning. There's my ticket. Um, uh, and this is called Why It's, um, what's it called? <laughs> Why it's Kicking Off Everywhere by Paul Mason. And he talks about the political stuff in the UK, the Arab Spring and Occupy and so on, and how that's happening and why. But if you flip that hierarchical, actually, it maybe looks more like that. And those things are usually positioned as oppositional, you know, either hierarchical or horizontal. But what if you did start connecting them so you have the hierarchical and the horizontal stuff and you start drawing this kind of web of connections between them? That's what we're trying to do with Brickstart. Work with the self-organizing layer, but also get, get into the dark matter of government so that we draw the learning from the horizontal up into it. And that's where the connections become the most important things, the relationships between things. And maybe over time, actually, those things start moving towards each other in some way. That's, that's the idea here. Malcolm Gladwell says that uh, you can't really just, you can't do systemic change just by working with network effects which is kind of a, I mean, very anti-social media and things, so you've got to take it with a pinch of salt to some extent. But I think he's right to some degree that you, if you really want to change something there and you're working against a hierarchy, you need to have a hierarchy in your toolkit in some way. So we, we don't, again, we don't want to ditch what's good about the welfare state, public service and government and the social contract, but if you want to recalibrate it to take advantage of these new positions. Uh, I think the thing about interventions is that they're not really hard enough. That's the thing. It's, uh, it's always a sign if it's too easy to get something up. And I think that maybe Parking Day, which is a good example of a great intervention, I think, which is a little bit systemic, is also something that's quite easy to do. And, and it, again, it hasn't really changed much afterwards. And systemic stuff is quite hard. Um, and I think that's because you really have to work with the city's primary drivers behind these things. And interventions often don't get into that. That means the economy, or the economy in the widest sense of the word. 
Uh, and it's really getting out of this domain as well. So again, back patterning to organized designers up there. And this is actually really management consultants, lawyers, policy makers, people like that. We need to start blurring the line between those things a lot more than we do. It's not a very productive relationship at the moment. So that's what strategic design is about, I guess. Uh, and so just to sum up, I've talked about a bunch of things. <laughs> A lot of words there, and, uh, and I'll just, because I, I worked on Monocle, I can't leave anything without a list of five things or ten things. Top five, blah, about blah. So uh, these are the half-formed thoughts to sum up with around this decision-making idea. So the first really optimistic one, I hope, anyway, is that the world is actually mutable. Again, we've, we've designed the world in a certain way. So it's, it's an outcome of our design decisions, right? So we can actually design them a different way. If we think about design as an active thing around policy and governments, that, that's quite interesting. Um, Jonathan Ive, uh, the head of design at Apple, said this. It's the way that you look at the world. And um, I guess it's one of the sort of curses of what you do is that you're constantly looking at something and thinking, why, why, why is it like that? Well, why is it like that and not like this? I love the pained expression on his face when he's saying, imagine been looking at the world through Jonathan Ives' eyes and seeing that everything isn't designed like by him, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that chair like that? Oh, God. Um, anyway, it's, kind of, it's interesting that you, you think like that, uh, but not everybody thinks like that. So Philip Colligan at Nesta, who's a sort of UK equivalent, I suppose, talks that policymakers make design decisions all the time without really thinking of the design decisions. So what if we did start thinking of them as design decisions? I mean, it means that we can redesign and change, that we can actually get a different vocabulary and a different ethos around those things. Would that be useful? I'd argue that it would in a way because it gives you a sense of hope, if nothing else. We can redesign things if we want to. It's not all too complex. It's not all just the result of uh, intangible, invisible forces but actually things that if we understand the architecture of the problem, we can begin to pull apart and change a bit. One of the ways we might do that is to use prototyping and iteration more than we do. So, now that's really complex in terms of politics, because in political capital, you have to be very clear about your direction and your statements. So, Obama said, yes, we can. He didn't say, yes, we'll try, um, which is probably more accurate, of course, but he still didn't say, you know, that. <laughs> Um, depends on the House of Representatives, I don't know how it will go, you know, depends on the budget, da, 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 but you can't say that when you're running because you need to generate political capital. And, but this is actually more realistic. It's much more realistic to talk about a strategic orientation of some kind of goal, but realize that you're going to take multiple steps on the way, and you don't know all of those steps, but if you take multiple readings and do course correction on your way, I think as my colleague Stuart Candy said, you don't need to know true north. Uh, to get to the North Pole, essentially. You need to head off in a northerly direction and keep taking readings in a northerly direction, essentially. So, now that's quite optimistic, again, and positive. You don't need to know all of the things in advance because, actually, we don't, and we can't possibly, and expertise is less useful for, than ever in terms of telling us that. Risk assessment, in particular, is problematic. So, Joey Ito, who's the head of the media lab at MIT and a venture capitalist, so this now, in terms of risk assessment in venture capital, the cost of assessing risk is now greater than the cost of failing quite often. So people are now skipping risk assessments and just seeing what happens, because it's actually cheaper to do it that way than trying to assess risk um, with due diligence, actually. So I've talked a lot about hinging policy to delivery via stewardship. I've talked a lot about designing for scale and system and platform and iteration and interaction. There's, um, I've written some more about some stuff which is coming out in a... An e-book, I was going to say a book, it's not really a book, it's an e-book, they're not really books, are they? Anyway, so it's coming out soon, so there'll be some more detail on these things there. But I'll leave you with this thought, that uh, we have to deal with the matter. The, the matter matters. You, you don't get at all of this stuff unless you actually do design the building. You don't figure out that you've got to change the building codes to enable, to unlock <coughs> timber construction business and forestry unless you are do, doing the building. That's when it actually gets real. That's when the MacGuffin kind of power kicks in. But also the dark matter matters. You don't get to do the building unless you change the building code. And that's a stroke of legal paperwork again, which took a while, and some lawyers. That is also part of the design challenge. So the matter and the dark matter are absolutely fundamental to this. And we can look back to the 15th century, 16th century and Machiavelli to see why this is. If you're trying to change something, I guess don't try and read this now, but it, it, you have very little, very few people on your side 
All of your enemies are the people that are there uh, resisting your every move because it changes their, the reason why they're in a position of power in some way. And you have, as he puts it, at best, uh, lukewarm defenders and those who may do well under the new order of things. So it's tough. Again, I go back to those failures at the start. That's why this work is so difficult. But we won't get to it unless we start looking at decision-making itself and the culture of that as a way of making better things, and in particular making better cities, given how holistic and complex they are, means designing how we make better decisions. And that's how you say thank you in Finnish. So, thank you. Thank you.